we are now going to dig deeper into the issue of speech on college campuses after the University of Pennsylvania's president resigned over the weekend. As we just told you, Liz McGill, the presidents of Harvard and MIT as well, all three of them strongly criticized after a congressional hearing last week. And when asked what would they do if anyone on their campuses, this was the question put to them, called for the genocide of Jews, they said it all depends on the context. Wesleyan University President Michael Roth argues leaders on college campuses have an obligation to speak out against hate. He's with us now. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. The answer to the question is obvious. It's yes, yes. you should punish them because they've broken the rules. They've made it impossible for lots of other people to learn on your campus. That's intolerable. So let's get to the less obvious, which is what should happen to these other university presidents. And then as a follow up, which we'll get to later, is where is this line between free speech and hate speech? But first, what should happen to the other presidents? Well, I think that their own campuses should make that decision and uh, given the fullness of their performance as presidents. That was uh, a four-hour hearing, and there was a terrible uh, a moment there that has gone viral. But whether they should lose their job, uh, I, I guess, as a president, I hope they don't lose their job, not only because of this, I belong to the union of college presidents, but because they, they um, would then be subject to these outside forces, the Republican congresswomen on the one hand, but also these big donors who are trying to throw their weight around. And I think that's not good for the long-range health of these schools. It doesn't yeah. really matter that much. Who the president of Harvard is? Well, you get, why why you does it not matter? Why does it not? I mean, I, I think there will be there have yeah. been presidents, good right. presidents of Harvard, bad presidents of Harvard. They've they, the Harvard is what it is. The president shouldn't just be the, the head bureaucrat. The president should take a stand and and be a, a moral beacon for the school. But when they're not, the school will be fine. Mm -hmm. So I think it to me is extraordinary that so much attention is being given to whether pres the presidents will resign or be fired. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's not the least important job in America, but How, it's not the most important. But but uh, it is also remarkable. I mean, you mentioned the party affiliation of the congressperson who did the questioning, yes. which to me would seem to be irrelevant, except in the context of colleges are run by liberals, taught by liberals, attended by liberals, and have been very good at cracking down on speech that offends liberals. And now here, not so quick to crack down. Yeah, I think actually anti-Semitism affects liberals also, and 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 I think in this case uh, they were uh, trapped by a series of questions, starting with would you would you condemn a, a speech about the Antifada? Would you condemn uh, calls for freedom of Palestine? And the answer to those questions, if you have free speech, has to be no. We can't stop that from happening. And then it became would you condemn genocide? And the the answer should be yes, of course. Yes, we should. but what, what I'm asking you is whether the anti-Semitism on college campuses has grown out of a culture on college campuses where the left can say anything and people on the right can't say much, and there's a failure to correct or even to expose kids to conflicting ideas. Free expression I, is on ice, in other words. I don't think that's true. I think you read a lot about that. I think there's a lot more anti-Semitism in the media than there is on college campuses. There's a lot, there's certainly a lot more anti-Semitism in Congress than there is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I, I don't think the issue is they fail to crack down on anti-Semitism. I do think we suffer from a lack of intellectual diversity in higher education. And I've, for years, have called for an affirmative action program for conservatives on college campuses. And I talk with my faculty at Wesleyan about this all the time. Most of them disagree with me. They think they are fully capable of teaching a religious text, even if they are not a member of that religious group. Point taken. Nonetheless, I think we should be very suspicious when people uh, at a university or anywhere else hire folks who look a lot like them. That's a mark of bias, mm. or at least potentially so. Mm. And my faculty is very open to having this conversation. I haven't persuaded them all, but I, and my students are totally open to studying religious texts, radical texts, conservative texts. Well, I mean, that does not seem to be the case, though, in a lot of campuses. I like at the beginning of the interview, you said, listen, the answer is obviously yes. If the answer is so obviously yes to condemn it, why was it so hard to do? And how do we have this conversation? I feel we're all tiptoeing through the tulips, yeah. trying not to offend anybody. Yeah. So I, if I, it's so easy, Michael, why was it so hard? I, I, I asked myself that question the last few days because I'm, I'm sure these are decent people and they're, they, they would be against genocide of any form. And why they, they gave a lawyerly response that sounded totally coached. That's what you think it was lawyerly and coached. Is I, it the so. I mean, I don't want to blame the lawyers. They're yeah. big, they, these are presidents. They, they should be able to stand up and say, I would not tolerate genocide on my campus. 
I, I remember when I was a young professor, the president of Pomona College kicked a Nazi group off campus when he heard they were on campus. The lawyer said, you can't do that. They've, they've paid for it. He said, if I'm going to be sued by someone, let it, I, I'll be sued by the Nazi party. That's fine with me. I thought that was heroic. Um, so how do we have these, com di these difficult conversations? How do we do it? Well, we, get, we practice. I mean, the whole point of being a student is learning to practice freedom. And the only way you practice freedom is by trying to work out your ideas in relation to people who have different ideas than you have. If our colleges do become bubbles where everybody thinks the same thing, the, if they do become bastions of prejudice, no one will learn very much at all. Yeah, it's definitely true. I, I, I think the answer to the question of why they couldn't answer is genocide a violation of a bullying code is because they are filtering things through the left. But you don't see it that way at all. You don't think... I see they're filtering things through a law firm. <laughs> through a law firm. I mean, Not but, you know, there's a free speech organization called uh, FIRE. I know it's them an acronym. Well. You know them well, right? So they rank free expression on college campuses. Harvard and Penn are at the very, very bottom. Wesleyan's in the middle, but even at your university, it's seven to one, liberal to conservative students. And half the student body says they self-censor once or twice a month. Yeah. How is that free expression and learning? I think, I th I think the, uh, the, the issue of self-censorship is a big deal. And as teachers at colleges and universities, we have to give, help students find the courage to speak up when they think they're going to be criticized by others. It's certainly the truth that, the, that this generation... Nobody has that kind of courage these days. I, a lot yeah. of people do, Can't actually. be wrong in public. But, yeah. you know, when I meet with my students and I ask them to get into groups and make a decision about an impossibly difficult uh, subject, whether they would uh, take a pill, let's say, to erase the memory of a violent sexual assault, they sit in groups of eight or nine and they debate that and then they report out and not, they don't have the same answers. They're not afraid. Why? Because we've built up some trust. trust. The most important thing, and Daniel Allen has made this point more generally yeah. about America, we need to build trust on campus. It's not just about yeah. eradicating expressions of hate and microaggressions. Michael. We need to build trust so that we can learn together. Michael, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've got to pay some bills. You're an example, I think, for college presidents talking about these issues, mm -hmm. being so public, the op-eds, all of it. Thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you for Appreciate having me. Thank you.